I'm super excited about this conversation to come because we are talking about climate a lot. We are talking about uh, CO2. We are talking about the, the emissions, the footprint. But uh, we often forget about uh, biodiversity. And that's there. It's uh, in our feet. It's, uh, it's very... It's just under our feet when we are running in the mountains, when we are cycling, when we are skiing. And it's, uh, it's a very important... Uh, topic because without biodiversity, uh, climate doesn't matter at the end. So uh, I'm I'm pleased to introduce to to all of you Hilary Gerardi that many of you might know as a but as athlete, but uh, also she's also a good. Uh, she she works for biodiversity. She works in the Korea Mont Blanc to to study the ecosystems in the in the Alps. So uh, hi Hilary, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on, Kelly, and I'm excited to talk about biodiversity and tell everybody about why it's the most important of all the subjects they're going to learn about in the Climate Athlete Climate Academy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so let's go for it. Why, why biodiversity is the most important thing? Well, so before I even go to like the why it's the most important thing, I want to make sure that everybody like has a pretty good idea of what we're talking about when we're talking about biodiversity. Um, because a lot of times we think about it really just as visible things, but it's a really big subject and it includes all the plants, bacteria, animals, us as well. Humans are part of the biodiversity um, of the planet. And so overall on Earth, we're talking about probably estimated around 8.7 million species that exist on earth um, and we've only at this point identified and really described about 1.2 million species so there's still a lot to learn it's a pretty huge subject um, but in terms of why it's important I think that like you know for us as athletes like you said it's something that we come into contact with it's also a lot about what we love about the places that we run we bike we ski we can feel pretty directly connected to it. Uh, for example, like when you go out, like what do you love about being outdoors? Maybe it's like big forest canopies. Maybe it's big green hillsides. Maybe it's you really like seeing marmots or chamois when you're out in the mountains. Uh, those are some reasons that it's important for us. Um, but as you mentioned, I work so for Crea Mont Blanc, which is the research center for alpine ecosystems here in Chamonix. And um, we try to study the impacts of climate change on biodiversity and then share that information uh, and our methods with the public. Um, and one of my jobs personally, because I do some fundraising, that's part of my work, is trying to convince people why it's important, <laughs> why biodiversity and studying it is important. And I think that, um, you know, usually um, part of that job is essentially relating it to humans and saying like, why is it important for humans? So like we can think about it in a lot of different ways, but I usually break it down to like economic reasons. That's one re reason why it's important. Like they provide a lot of what we call ecosystem services. So fertile soils, pollution control, clean water, flood control, also things like fisheries, food, tourism, all that gives us money. So biodiversity can actually literally give us money. Uh, and then biodiversity has a lot of social benefits too. So um, the importance of biodiversity in different species, for example, for national or regional identity, um, you've got a lot of recreational value, like we said, for the sports that we do. We also place value in some different species. Um, like or different landscapes because it's aesthetically appealing uh and there's also things around health and well-being um because a lot of you know biodiversity different species discovery helps us know how to better um uh you know do do medicine better for example and then the last thing that i just wanted to to uh point out was about cultural and spiritual benefits as well because for a lot of communities um you know, biodiversity, different plants and animals have a lot of importance in terms of, you know, their customary uses, especially by Native and Indigenous communities. Uh, and there's a real spiritual benefit. So hopefully that's like a good resume, sums up a, a bunch of different reasons why we should care about it, um, at least as why it's important for, for humans. Yeah, it seems pretty important. It seems that it's it has a lot of angles to, to take on. It's, it's important for... Yeah, as you mentioned, like 
everything almost. And I believe that the these connections that we are connected, it's it, we are not living in a world like uh, we use resources for us as humans, but like we need uh, the all the other um, species on Earth to 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 survive and and to 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 just. Uh, one single species alone probably could not survive on the planet. So uh, we need to to preserve. Uh, probably we are bad on like we will lose some some of this uh, biodiversity. It's 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 lost, but preserving a, a big part of it it ensures uh, our uh, survival as a species too. So uh, I believe that it's as humans. If we are egoistic, if we want to survive, we need to to think about uh, about biodiversity. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I really like that you just said is the importance of the connections between different species. So like we as humans are really dependent on all of these other species that exist. We couldn't live without them, but there's also a lot of connections between them. Um, and you're totally right. Like there's a, a huge threat to biodiversity. Um, I think, you know, some of the, the recent studies have said that like by 2100, we might lose 18% of the world's plant species, 22% of the world's animal species. Some sort of more pessimistic scientists are even say that maybe half of the species on earth are going to be wiped out by the, uh, by the next century. But so basically, I mean, I think what's interesting is that we there's so much left to know about it and where everything is connected and there are all of these interactions and we don't know how all those interactions work. We as humans don't even realize that there are a bunch of species out there that we're probably <laughs> dependent on and we don't even know what they are. Um, and so preserving them is really important to the extent that we can, because uh, when you lose one species, even if you never knew it existed, you don't know what kind of like cascading impact that might have on the rest of the ecosystem. Yeah, and, uh, w when you're saying that, I imagine like uh, the the like the elephants or the pandas or the the white um, snow leopards that they are extincting. But it feels that somehow we know better the animals and the species that they are exotic than the species that they are <laughs> close to home. Like. Uh, uh, um, I think if if you talk with uh, with kids, like they will tell you like uh, ten animals, and they will tell you probably ten animals that they are exotic, but not knowing what's the close biodiversity. Lions, and that's tigers, bears. <laughs> exactly, and then it's like what's in your backyard? What's the biodiversity? What's the the natural? Uh, yeah, the the uh, what are the species living in 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 your house? Like uh, the, these small. Uh, ants or like spiders or like uh, the, the plants that they live and we know less about that and and i think uh, on education we we need to learn more about like the species that they are surrounding us because uh we need to preserve them too Absolutely. I mean, as I mentioned at the beginning, like, you know, bacteria is also part of biodiversity, right? So like, we know so little about a lot of these things. And so there is a need for a lot more scientific research. I think even around some of the the uh, bigger animals that you that you might be thinking of as well, we've realized through our work that like our knowledge, for example, of even species, alpine species in the Alps, is pretty limited in terms of like in the Chamonix Valley where I live, you know, what's the abundance, like how many uh, distribution, what kind of habitats they use, what are they dependent on? We don't actually know that much about it. So there's a lot of scientific research left to be done um, and really important to, as you said, sort of recenter and be like, uh, kind of in the same way that we've, it may be a lot of us in the last year have stopped saying, I want to travel everywhere in the world. There's a lot to do, right, you know, in my own backyard. It's also, I can, you know, stop learning about all of the animals all across the world. There's an awful lot I don't know, just literally in my house or just outside of my house. Yeah, and, and you you are working in, in Chamonix Valley, uh, monitoring all these uh, different species, and ha has it changed? Like, has it changed uh, how the ecosystems are now compared to like ten or twenty years ago? Yeah, they they definitely have, and so I mean, the different things that impact um, biodiversity and the impact. Um, 
sort of landscapes and things like that can both be directly because of climate change. And a lot of it has to do with land use as well. So like, you know, we see in a lot of Europe, for example, that there was clear cutting for agriculture. And so now we're seeing different kinds of forests coming back. Um, But then we're also seeing things specifically in the mountains, you know, like, the mountains are a pretty, pretty big biodiversity hotspot because you can get a lot of different habitats in a small amount of space. So like a mountain, you know, that goes all the way up like this because the climatic conditions are so different. You can have all these stages um, with uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of different conditions and then different species that are adapted to those conditions. And with climate change in particular, what we see is that things are generally moving upslope in the same way that things are kind of a lot of species are moving northward as well, um, or moving closer to the poles anyway, to try to find conditions that are similar. Um, Studies basically show that for plants, they're moving upslope in a place like the Alps around 20 to 30 meters per uh, decade. So every 10 years, um, uh, you're seeing that going up slope. Um, And then for animals, which can move a little bit faster than plants, as you can imagine, because they usually have legs um, or wings, uh, they're moving more like around 30 meters on average. Um, And what's interesting about that Well, there are a couple of things. One is that um, basically, right, if you have a plant species that interacts with its ecosystem and all the other species that live there, and one plant is moving 10 meters upslope, but the animal that usually is dependent on it has to move 30 meters upslope, you can see that there are like sort of these desynchronization and shifts. So we see changes in where they're located, but we haven't learned yet really what all the implications for that is um, and exactly what that'll mean for the different species. The other thing that's interesting to think about is, right, because mountains are generally shaped like cones, there's less and less habitat as you move up the mountain. And so you can't, a species essentially as it moves up slope, can be losing in surface area. So the amount of habitat it has um, is definitely um, is definitely changing and generally getting smaller. In the short term, you probably talked uh, quite a bit about um, about glacial melt. In the short term, I guess we can say sort of it's good news for some plants and animals that there are some places there used to be glaciers so they couldn't live before. And now that opens up a little bit of habitat that, for example, plants are colonizing uh, when the glaciers melt, uh, but it's not a great long-term solution for them. Yeah, it seems that, uh, yeah, it's... It's pretty scary, actually, uh, all, all you are saying. And um, w- you are saying that uh, climate change is affecting uh, this biodiversity. But I think that um, also it has a threat with um, over-frequentation of the mountains, over-frequentation of these natural sites, that they have a, a limited um, capacity of, of uh, holding. Like uh, it's, it's not the same, probably, uh, depending the species they are, depending the fragility of these species, how many humans can be in this area uh, on, a, on a sustainable way. So uh, I think uh, we, we have a role to play on that. Uh, and, and as athletes that we are all the time training, going to outdoors to, to practice, we have a role on preserving these areas that we might love, but uh, with... Uh, Without knowing, I, I don't think it's uh, nobody does because he wants to harm. But without knowing, we are harming them and 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 helping the yeah the, this loss of uh, biodiversity. So you are an athlete uh, and you have all this knowledge. So what would you say? What what should we do? What should I do when I go to to run on a trail or to ski? Uh, to yeah, to be a bit more uh, friendly to the ecosystems. Yeah, I think that's a really great, great question. And I think that, um, you know, it, we're, we are seeing a lot more people practicing mountain sports, a lot more people seeing value in being in the mountains. And also as it gets 
hotter, right, lower down, people are seeking refuge in the mountains as well. So there are a lot more people, and you're totally right that you have. To, we need to start being really deliberate when we think about, you know, how are we interacting with these spaces. And I think there's a couple different ways. For me, I usually think about protection of biodiversity in terms of like passive and active and like the passive is like how can I do as little harm as possible and active is like I'm actively trying to do good and I think a lot of the initiatives um, it, that the Killian Tronet Foundation is putting together are great things that will enact positive change worldwide a lot of collective uh, collective in, uh, actions that will have sort of big widespread uh, impact but in terms of like when we're out as an athlete doing different things. I don't know, are you familiar with the leave no trace principles, which are pretty popular in the US? Um, so that's something that I definitely think about. And some of those main principles can be applied generally anywhere. Um, but they include, you know, like stay on the trail. Um, uh, because, you know, one of the biggest things around, you know, loss of biodiversity is habitat loss. And if we are basically spreading out everywhere we go, rather than kind of concentrating on a trail, then we're, we're impacting that habitat on a larger scale. Uh, there is also, you know, leave what you find kind of avoid picking, you know, too many, picking flowers, picking plants, taking things with you. You want to be disposing of waste properly. You want to be respecting the wildlife. And I think that's one of, of the big things, especially for people who aren't used to uh, being out in an area where there is a lot of wildlife. It gets really exciting to like see it, right? You know, oh, I want to get closer. I want to get a better picture of, you know, that marmot or, or whatever it is. And the best is really not to be going running after or approaching different animals. Definitely don't be feeding animals. Um, I think that something else that we can do is that when, either, whether it's at home or when we're visiting a new area, is to learn as much as we can about uh, how we can respect the wildlife where it where you are because it's not the same everywhere you go um and so i think you know sort of one example is if you're visiting a new place or even if you live somewhere is try to learn about what is going on locally if there is habitat restoration if there are wildlife reserves different places have seasonal restrictions as well about where you can go and what you can do um an example for skiing, I don't know if you've come across this, but some species really need calm places to like hibernate or to reproduce. And so sometimes if you're skiing, say there might be an area where you're not supposed to go because uh, rock ptarmigan spend the winter there. And um, sometimes that kind of stinks because you know, it's like nobody has skied there and there's fresh powder. <laughs> um, but sometimes you have to kind of say, well, you know, we think of this area as a playground, right? We, we oftentimes use this term. This is our playground. This is where we play. But we should be thinking about it also in terms of, um, you know, this may be our playground, but in the end, we're visitors there. And the biodiversity that lives there, where it, whether it's plants or animals, are really like the full-time and long-term residents of these places. And we're visiting their home. Right. It's not it's not my home. I'm visiting theirs. <laughs> that that's a good point. Get informed because as you mentioned, like it might be species that we don't know that they are living there or uh that yeah, it's it's their home and we are visitors and I think that's that's a good resume on mm -hmm. on on that. So yeah, it's it's a lot to do like on, on that and as athletes we have an important role on uh getting informed when we hit the trails or we go climbing or we go skiing, uh, probably we, it, sometimes it's not easy to get the information uh, about that, but uh, we should spend, like we spend a lot of time doing like a lot of research or like where to find like a good snow or where to the weather forecast or gear wise. So we should spend a bit more time on, on finding about uh, biodiversity. Uh, so thank you very much for, for that, um, that advice, Hillary. I think it will be very resourceful for everybody out there and uh yeah i think it's uh the job you're doing uh both as an athlete that uh you are amazing in in all the races that you do but uh especially uh connecting that to um to to preserving the environment is just uh, just amazing so thank you very much for for being with us today 
Well, thank you so much for having me. And I think that, you know, uh, what I would love to say is that I think a lot like you, you know, I see the mountains as a cool place, you know, to, to perform, to push myself, to experience new things. But it's also a place that I like sort of, you know, go to fulfill my needs, um, you know, whether that's or in terms of well-being. And a lot of that can come. You can get a lot of that by sometimes slowing down as well and really sort of seeing what you can observe and absorb um, when when you're out in the mountains. And so keeping that in mind and the fact that, um, you know, we all have a role to play and we all are legitimate in terms of who can talk about this and who can want to take action on this, I think is really important. Um, and so I appreciate you having me on to, to talk about it. And I hope that it will inspire people to, to want to, to learn more and to get involved in their own local communities and however they can. Thank you very much. Sure it will.